the Afslout Dyke is leveling up. This Dutch icon of hydraulic engineering is getting a well-deserved upgrade. The first major one in 90 years. Time to take a look at what we're doing to make sure that the dike that closes off never shuts down. You're watching Waterworks, a series of educational videos about the Afslout Dyke, in which we take a closer look at this beloved dam. Despite the fact that the Dutch name refers to it as a dike, it is actually a dam, which closes off parts of the sea surrounding the Netherlands. In this video, we'll talk about water management. We'll learn about the unbreakable bond of pumps and sluices, about generating power for 9,000 people, and we'll pump up the base, gently. As we've learned in previous videos, the Afslout Dyke created a giant freshwater lake in the middle of the Netherlands, the IJsselmeer or Lake Isel, which serves as an important source of fresh water used for drinking and irrigation. The Isselmeer also has very well-regulated water levels. This is important considering a large part of the surrounding area is at risk of flooding. This is not a natural process, however. In fact, the water level in the Isselmeer is very closely regulated through a series of discharge sluices. There are two large rivers leading into the Eiselmeer, the Eisel, which provides the bulk, and the Overijsselsevecht. And if you've ever spoken to a Dutch person, they most likely mention it rains quite a bit too. This combination leads to an incredible amount of water going into the lake, up to 400 cubic meters of water every second. That's enough to fill an Olympic swimming pool every six seconds. It may seem easy enough to drain fresh water, but you have to keep in mind that the other side of the Afslout Dyke is full of salt water. To allow for proper discharge without taking in seawater, we devised a couple of things. Firstly, the discharge sluices are only opened when the water in the sea is lower than that of the lake. That only happens twice a day for around four to five hours. Sometimes conditions are against us whereby the wind raises the tide so high against the dam that we can't use the sluices for more than a week. Once the sluices are open, however, they discharge fast, up to 3,000 cubic meters of water every second. This technique has worked for a long time, but as the water level keeps rising, discharge times are shortening. Now we're setting our sights to the year 2050. We calculated that we needed to account for an extra 30 centimeters of sea level rise, but even more than that can't be ruled out. We therefore devised another solution, one that works night and day in the form of pumping stations, which are groups of big electric pumps that suck the water from the bottom of the lake and discharge it into the sea on the other side. They use energy though, and they don't move water as fast as the sluices. That's why we created a sort of motto that sums up our water management quite nicely. Draining if possible, pumping when necessary. Based on this motto, we asked Research Institute Deltares to figure out what extra capacity we'd actually need. Deltares was able to calculate how much discharge and pumping capacity was required to accomplish the project goals for 2050. This helped to set clear guidelines for suggesting cost-effective, safe and environmentally friendly solutions. It was a challenge to come up with a method and guidelines in which different designs could be assessed. This was necessary because all candidate consortia had a free hand in their design and there are many types of pumps, each with their own specifications. Eventually, building consortia level was selected as the team with the best overall idea. They proposed a solution where they add two new groups of discharge sluices and two new pumping stations. Both are located in an Uber. The pumps have a capacity of 300 cubic meters per second, which would fill a swimming pool in around eight seconds. The building of these pumps was a learning process. The enormous flow of water from the open discharge sluices disrupt the water level and the inflow of the pumping stations. The old and the new discharge sluices also have an impact on each other. As a result, which the individual discharge sluices become a little less effective than we're used to. As it turns out, when you're working on something as complicated as hydraulic engineering, even one plus one isn't always two. 
So let's have a closer look at the new pumping stations. What do they actually look like? Two large pumping stations with three pumps, each pump more than 4.5 meters wide and using a two megawatt engine. That's enough power to power a passenger aeroplane. We hope to use these giants as little as possible in the coming years, but with the sea levels rising rapidly, they'll likely be in near constant use come 2050, especially in the winter when more water enters the lake. Powering giant pumps like this requires, well, a lot of power. To account for that, we're also building solar panels, enough of them to still be energy neutral in 2050, when we will need 22,000 megawatt hours to keep the pumps running. For comparison, that's the same amount of power 9,000 people use every year. Now that we've figured out the energy aspect, one challenge remained, or rather, lots of little challenges, fish. Giant motors sucking in water from the bottom of the lake doesn't sound like the ideal new neighbor for local eels, smelts, and bass. To help them safely navigate out of the lake, we ensured that the pumps double as a doorway for local fish. A return trip's possible too through the discharge sluices. The pump's fish-friendly design ensures that 98 out of 100 fish will be able to pass through without any problems. We're pumping up the sea bass safely. Sorry for the pun, couldn't resist. Finally, we also made a fish migration river as another option. This is a four kilometer long road where fish can pass through the dam without having to pass through the pumps or discharge sluices. We're proud of the work we're doing to strengthen the Afslout Dyke. We've done everything in our power to protect our country against rising sea levels, looking all the way to the expected climate changes up until 2050. Will it be enough? We honestly don't know. That's why we're putting an emphasis on adaptive water management. Everywhere we're adding protections, we make sure there's room for an upgrade when needed. A climate-friendly way of being flexible and safe. Thank you for watching Waterworks, the series where we take a look at what makes the Afslout Dyke an icon, both in the past and in the future. Make sure to check out the other videos if you haven't, and we'll see you next Tide.